I always like to start out with highlighting the team's educational experiences. And though right currently we are all credentialed and what we need to be to help you as our client and to help you understand the college educational process, the admissions process, what's going on, we also had our own experiences coming to the table. So though I'm a school counselor and I'm credentialed globally, I'm also credentialed as a scholarship coach, I'm a life coach, I have published research based on college admissions and being an at-risk student. I really want you to know my story as being a, from a blue collar family. And when I first attempted to go to college, I wasn't very successful because neither of my parents had gone to college. They met in the Air Force. They are successful business owners. However, that was not, um, neither of my parents went to college. They met in the Air Force. They started a construction business. They've been very successful in that, but they still didn't understand the college process. It was very challenging. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't understand the financial aid process and the fact that I was assigned an advisor who really couldn't connect me with the courses and the process in a way that was meaningful to me, I ended up dropping out. We have Paul, who's highly educated, very interested in going to college, also credentialed. He ended up getting his master's at Oxford University, which is a really challenging to do as an American student. His parents were very in favor of education. However, Paul ended up having a medical problem that made putting, made, made it so that he couldn't, Paul ended up having a medical problem that pushed him out three years. So that was a challenge in itself. We come to our latest team member, Sayoko Kuohari, who is, came from Japan, was educated at Boston University, has been working in, uh, in, in an international business capacity, self-employed, working with medical devices. She ended up staying after she was educated. She went straight from high school to college to owning her own business, and now she is transitioning into our career field. She also came from a construction family. However, they believed in education. They did not have the opportunity to go, partly because of World War II and the results of that, but she loved her education, loved being educated, loved being educated in America. She only wishes that she had participated a little more socially. And then we have Nias, our Boise native, Again, he wasn't sure what he wanted to study. He knew he has a gift for artistic stuff. He loves technology. And fortunately, College of Western Idaho now has a really slam dunk degree that brings both of them in together, which ends up being a communications degree. Both his parents are educated, very much believe in education but also believe in allowing their children to explore and figure out what best suits them. And fortunately, Nias came as an intern to the coaching educator and it's turned into a career move for him. Why do we send our kids to college? So you just heard why. Why do people go to college? Why do we send our kids to college? Oftentimes, it has to do with we want our children to be able to afford living. We want them to have job opportunity. And one of the ways that you do that is you provide them with an education. We are big believers in the trade schools. I myself started in the trade schools. I was a barber for 12 years. I had my own business and it was a really, really good opportunity for me to grow and have an understanding of my interests and then head back to college. And my second time at college, I was very successful. So here we have uh, the last recession we had, the job gains, the people who were employed were people who had degrees. We want you to understand whenever there's an economic recovery going on, 
that, and we expect it to soon come, we all are very aware of what's been going on with COVID and the economic impact. The last two economic recoveries, the students or the people who had some college education were more successful in getting a job. So it is very important now more than ever to be looking at college or trade or some form of post-secondary education. When we had our last economic recovery, we had this split, which was very unique and interesting. We had the haves and the have-nots. And what happened is a lot of the blue-collar jobs ended up not being sought after and the ones that were more sought after were business management, the health professionals, and technical occupations, IT jobs, things like that. So many of the trade schools had a really hard time sustaining themselves. We are seeing an interest now in the trade schools growing. So it's important for us to know that even though through a recession, it can cause a real shift in what the um, country needs and what jobs are available, the trades are growing. So our introduction here is the research that we use from Georgetown concerning post-recession recession job gains. But we also, um, we, we like to look at the different expectations that students have and parents have. So a lot of our graphs and charts are reflected from studies. So as I mentioned before, I went back to school a second time and was much more successful. But where I wasn't successful is I really didn't understand the whole financial aid process. That impacted my ability to get to college debt free. So it's very important for you to really understand how financial aid works so that you don't end up in the same with the same problem that I ended up with because owing a lot of student debt is not fun. So the biggest college concerns that we hear from families are less about, well, they don't even know what to study. What they really are concerned about is, can we afford it? Are we eligible for financial aid? What does the financial aid package look like? What does it mean? And how do we apply for scholarships? This is what we are going to help you understand. First off, you need to know why college may cost you more. Time and time again, and it's always a challenge, many, many students fail to graduate in four years and colleges are making it so much more convenient to extend your college degree. And so you're earning a four-year degree in six years. And they even now are posting that statistic that, oh, if you graduate in four years, it's this much. In six years, it's this much. And this isn't the way to go. I mean, you really need to be heading off to college with the idea that you're gonna graduate in four years unless you're in a five-year program that qualifies you for a master's degree. And there are some out there and I would encourage you to look at them, but we want and we help our students graduate on time. So the other reason is kids are still choosing where their best friend is going, even if it's not a good match for them. Even if they're getting very little money, they're choosing where their best friend is going and they oftentimes end up, their best friend doesn't end up going or they end up not being best friends anymore. So it's important for you to be selecting a college based on your family's ability to pay, the, the match, are you a good match to that college? Things like, do I want a larger college, smaller college, smaller classes? Do they have a great learning center? Is it near a city? What are the things that are gonna help me and match well with me as a student? And that's super important for you to know. Also, the, the, a lot of students lose credit do, because they're transferring. So they think, oh, I'll just transfer. Well, many credits don't transfer. I mean, even in the state of Idaho, we had a huge issue until last year when it was finally announced that if you went to any of the community colleges, your, your educational credits would transfer to the state colleges. Previous to that, half of them wouldn't transfer. 
So it's always very important, and people ask me, and I'm a big fan of community college. When I went back to school, I was older. I had children. It was really helpful to be able to access a community college while I worked, and then I ended up transferring to my state university, and everything transferred. So it was a smooth transition, and I graduated in four years. That is not what's happening. And even if you're in the same major, I remember my son started out at a small private school that was, their big degree was in criminal justice. And when he tried to transfer those, those credits to Boise State, they weren't accepting them. It was really, really challenging. However, um, we came up with a better plan and he ended up graduating on time. So here we have the other problem, colleges, are now costing 34,000 per year. And you know, in the 1970s we were looking at about 1700 per year. You could you could earn money over the summer, you could help pay your tuition. Students could actually afford college. Some of them were going and supported themselves while they did it. That is a very challenging thing when your college now costs on average about 34,000 a year. It's gone up a thousand percent, over a thousand percent. It is very hard for a student to work a summer job, save enough money to be able to pay for tuition. So it's important for all of us to recognize that this new generation is facing this. Even though you have the cost of college, many people really don't understand what that looks like. And I love this slide because of it. You can literally take, as you can see, um, there's a column for your income. Find your income at the bottom where you kind of land. And the number that's at the top, let's just say you land in the 100,000 to 150,000. You have about, this is on average, about 17,449 left per year. So you're going to be taking that number and timesing it by four. That is a very scary number. So it's important for you to understand the process. That's where that number, we have to help students get scholarships. But don't think that that should prevent you from expanding your search, from having a really good list of colleges that may or may not be in your state, because oftentimes it may be cheaper to go to a private school than it is to go to your public school. And so what we want to do is help you to understand you don't want to eliminate just because based on cost. So when you do a Google search, hey, how much does Georgetown University cost? That is just on the internet and your child may qualify for more scholarships or financial aid of some sort and it may end up calculating to be cheaper than it is to go to your state school. And that's what we help you with. So it's really important to not eliminate colleges. And when we recommend the lists that kids put together, we recommend that you go after some more expensive schools because oftentimes they give more money. We also like fallback schools. So we like to see at least 10 colleges on your list. We like to see a couple high-end colleges that are maybe challenging to get into. We also like you to have four colleges that are really good, you know you qualify for, and then some ones that you know automatically that you will get into. So that list we develop with our students as they go along, but it's based on what we can earn for scholarships with them, the things that will help them um, just because a college gives a lot of money in scholarships, you have to be able to qualify for them. So we make sure that our students understand those pieces. So next we're looking at, you know, how do colleges calculate, how do they calculate financial aid? It is not an automatic across the board. So I always give, I'm living in Idaho now, I'm actually from New Hampshire, but, and this is across the nation, there are some colleges that will take outside scholarships and then there's others that won't. So I always give our state universities, Boise State, if you get an outside scholarship, you actually, they won't pull away your money. Whereas 
University of Idaho will only give you a certain amount of money. And if you come in with an outside scholarship, oftentimes they'll pull away some of the money they gave. Very, very important when you're going on your college visits to ask, am, uh, am I allowed to bring in outside scholarships? Are you going to take money away from me if I do? So it's really important for you to understand that colleges do uh, financial aid differently. It's not across the board. Even what's called the Western Exchange Scholarships. Some colleges will give it completely to you. And other schools, it's just an automatic, and other schools require that you have a certain ACT or SAT score and a certain grade point average before they will give you it. So some schools choose to give larger wooey scholarships to fewer kids. Other schools, every kid that applies from a Western Exchange state ends up getting money no matter what. Here we have, in 2010, many of the schools changed the really, um, you know, to they really changed how they look at financial aid and how they fund students. So Cornell and MIT and Duke and Stanford, several of the schools were looking at, okay, if you make under a certain amount, you're going to go for free. But they also are help you. I mean, they really work at you don't earn scholarships for many of these college, colleges. The goal is to get in, and they really work with you with financial aid through their endowments and grants. So it's important for you, if you are a strong student and can qualify for one of these high-end colleges, it is important for you to try to see if you can get in because you may find that it will be less money to go there than your state college. So the other thing that we like parents to understand is financial aid basics. So what is that when they talk about a financial aid, a Pell Grant? You know, so it's important to find out, do I qualify for financial aid? And if I qualify, what does that look like? Some people qualify for a Pell Grant, some people do not qualify for any grants. Some people qualify for subsidized loans and unsubsidized. Other people don't qualify for subsidized loans. So we're going to go over all this. So it's really important, number one, that you understand if you qualify for financial aid. The other thing is you need to have that in the back of your mind, like I talked about. How do schools distribute financial aid? That's important for you to know. Also, you need to see, do I qualify for their merit scholarships and what does that look like? What do they require if they're going to give their merit scholarships for having strong grades and strong scores? What does it look like and how much are they going to give me and will that make it more affordable? You want to know if your parents' assets, your assets as a parent, the assets that you have for your children, you need to know how assets are going to impact financial aid. That's one of the reasons why we work with credentialed financial advisors in order to create a situation where we can help you with that because there are really some good tax strategies. There's also, you have to have an understanding of your assets so that you have them in the right arenas so that the, it gives you the maximum amount of financial aid. And we also recommend kids need to be in the game. And how they can do that is to get their scholarship portfolio together. And that is going to be part three of this series is specific to students. Even though I think it's important for you to understand how this works, you also need to understand what do I need to get together to help me qualify for merit scholarships. So. Here we have, there are three types of financial aid. You're either going to get a full, full financial aid, partial, or none. And even if the federal government says, okay, you qualify for a full Pell Grant, you qualify for both student loans, the unsubsidized and the subsidized, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to afford a certain college. Because if they only give you 80% or 10%, of your financial aid based on what how they distribute it, 
it doesn't matter if you have a full pill. So it's important. You need to take that information and find the schools that give 100% financial aid based on your package, based on your EFC, your estimated family contribution, based on filling out the FAFSA and what the federal government says that you can afford to pay, which I'm just gonna tell you right now, most people are in the partial and none category. And when they get their estimated family contribution number, it seems ridiculous. And then you have to times it by four because that's what they're saying that you can afford to do. So it's super important to know, don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait till the last minute to understand what your EFC is about. We actually have a free estimator right on our website and it's important for you to have a good understanding. So knowing your estimated family contribution is huge. Knowing that number helps when you're looking for colleges. Knowing again, like I said, how public and private and elite colleges calculate, that is another added little tidbit that you have to understand. And also knowing how to negotiate your financial aid packages, including your scholarships. And there is a way. And you can't just go to a school and say, hey, I have five schools who are giving me all this money. Oh, you need to give me more. All schools have a process. You need to look at their process. You need to follow it to a T. You need to call and negotiate. There are several families we've worked with who had a medical condition of one of their children or, or a parent that really impacted them for several years or people lost their jobs. And so it's important to give the information that a school needs that will help you negotiate your package. So the other thing that we, again, we really encourage is you, there are many tools out there. Some are weaker than others. We use a tool that's very, very efficient. It's helpful. It gives you a nice report and it will start you on the process. You need to understand that financial aid is calculated on the year your student was in 10th grade. So you want to fill out this form as if your student, or if your student is in 10th grade, pretend they're heading off to college, that information from that year is the, the what they're gonna be using. Now, right now, we're in the middle of a crisis where many, many people, including our own company, have been greatly impacted. You need to understand that colleges are going to come up with a plan. I don't know what that looks like, but we are going to be reporting it on our YouTube channel, thecoachingeducator.com. Any information that we have, we will be putting it up and we will be letting you know anything that we find out. But understand that it shouldn't pause you on the idea of going to college but you're going to have to make sure that you keep track of how you have been impacted by financially by COVID-19. I am sure they're going to have the ability for you to present your case. So keep good records, keep records of how your income dropped, and that will be helpful. So, you have filled out your estimated family contribution, or you know what it is. You end up looking up a school that has the cost of attendance as a certain amount. Now you take that estimated family contribution and subtract it, and that payment, whatever is out of pocket, is what is left. And that is what you're going to be looking at for this amount of money I need to be encouraging my student to go after scholarships, or I as the student need to look at colleges who are gonna give me the most scholarships, and or I'm putting my portfolio together so I can qualify for more money. And that is how it's basically looked at. So the federal government has a federal methodology. They utilize a tool called the FAFSA we, you fill this out every year you are in your undergraduate years, and 
which is important for you, even if you are told by your accountant or you know you will not qualify for a Pell Grant or any of the grant funding that colleges provide, it is important for you to fill this out. Because if your child qualifies for merit, merit scholarships based on grades, they cannot release or are an athlete or get a music scholarship or get an art scholarship, you will not receive that money unless you fill out your FAFSA. It has to be filled out. So it's important for you to understand that. So the FAFSA needs to be filled out every year. It does not assess your home. So you don't have to worry. And that's probably the biggest error we catch. And that's one of the reasons why we work with families and fill it out with them is because we know that they have made some pretty uh, easy errors because you're not used to filling out the form. And just know that they don't look at your, your family home. They don't do a family farm. They don't look at your retirement accounts. So when you're calculating what you're worth, it's so important to not include that. The FAFSA form, it's, it's basically used to collect your income and your assets. And then they tell you how much, and believe me, it's a big number, how much they think you can afford. They don't ask you things like, where's your debt ratio at? And then we have institutional methodology. So some colleges ask for you to fill out the CSS profile. This is basically the FAFSA on steroids. You still have to fill out the FAFSA, but then you're filling out the CSS profile. Most schools only require that filled out once. Couple schools ask for it to be filled out every year. And so they use this in order to distribute from their endowments. If they're asking you to fill out this form, which is much longer than the FAFSA, they have more money to give. So don't, don't get discouraged. We also, they, they do look at your family home and they do look at your farm and they do assess if, you're, if your kids have assets. So it's important for you to know that. So there are two types of loans. If you qualify for a subsidized loan, that just means that you will not have to pay interest while you are in school. Most students who um, have a very high estimated family contribution will only qualify for an unsubsidized loan. It's still a very good deal. It has low interest, but you will be required. The interest will accrue, and it's about $100 a year as you're going to school. So the other thing is Perkins loans. Perkins loans are found at various schools. They are a federal government loan. They also have a lower interest, but not every school has them. We also have alternative loans, which now we can go back to um, taking loans out from banks. Previously, you could only take a loan out through Sally Mae, which always confused me a little since they were really um, quite instrumental in, in hammering on the housing you know, loan situation a couple of years ago. But um, we have had, uh, now it's changed back where you can get different kinds of loans. And it's important for you to look at that. The other loans that are available are Parent PLUS loans. I do not agree with these loans. These are very high interest. They are high interest. I mean, there's got, there has to be a better way. And if the only way that you can get to a school is to have your parents be co-signing a Parent PLUS loan, I don't think that's a very good way to start your educational uh, endeavor. I, it just means that it's probably not a school that you're well matched for. So I really want you to consider that. The, the next thing is you really have to know your financial aid timelines. And I know that you get oodles of emails and oodles of text messages and you're told constantly, you've got to fill out your FAFSA. It opens up October 1st. You do not need to fill it out October 1st. In fact, it's so clogged that day, it's ridiculous. It, it is not first to come, first serve. Every single college has a priority deadline. Many of the priority deadlines that I'm seeing are still in February. 
So I want you to pause and take the time and make sure you know your estimated family contribution before you fill out that FAFSA. It's super important because once that's in, you can change income appropriately, but if you put your assets in, which is one of the bigger impacts of whether or not you qualify for financial aid, you can't change it. It's done. It's the, they look at the assets from the day you fill it in. They look at your income two years previous. So it's important for you to not panic, to look at your priority deadlines. You can literally Google the school. University of New Hampshire priority deadline for financial aid and they'll give it to you and and you mark that and if your priority deadline are all in the following year in January or February then keep that in mind talk to your parents so that they can fill it out when they have reviewed where and how um, their assets are going to impact. So the best thing you can do is make sure you have your estimated family contribution before you fill out the FAFSA. The FAFSA gives you your estimated family contribution, which will be very similar if you're using a really good EFC tool like we have, and then you'll know what to do. The What happens next, and also the CSS profile. The CSS profile actually has started opening up in October. There are some schools, you have to have it finished by November 30th. Again, there are other schools, so you might have three schools in there that need the CSS profile. One of them might be November 30th, the other two might be later. So just keep those deadlines in mind. Don't just move with the crowd in a big panic and end up creating a situation where you can't be strategic with your assets. And let me make this clear. I'm not saying, you know, put, put money under your mattress, but there are some tra tax strategies and, and ways for creating a situation where you can go to college for less money. Your student aid report will come to the student's email that they use to fill out their FAFSA. And again, I don't like students filling out the FAFSA. They don't know the answers. There are questions that you really have to be someone who has been collecting a paycheck and understand taxes and things like that. It's just, it's ridiculous that they would ever assume that a kid could fill this out. If your parents have any type of investments, if they have different homes, it's important for you to not touch the FAFSA. And that's why we as a company fill it out with parents. Institutional financial aid forms. They haven't made it difficult enough for you, so believe it or not, there are, there are colleges who require their own institutional form. Now, sometimes that's good news. They might have scholarships that they don't just put up on their website, but it's important for you to remind your student that they have to check email, not their personal email. Every time you apply to a school, you, are, you have a new portal to log into. You have to go into there. And that's oftentimes where they will say, oh, you have a to-do. And if you don't fill out that extra sheet of paper, what happens is you don't get your financial aid released. So you're trying to make decisions on colleges when you don't even know how much you're going to get from a college. The other thing is a verification form. It feels like they're verifying if you're telling the truth, but that's not what they're doing. Colleges get verified and they have to select a certain amount of students from the pool of kids who apply. And they ask you to fill it out and basically it's their auditing system. They have to audit to make sure that they have to put paperwork in that shows that they are actually providing financial aid in a way that is acceptable to the federal government, but also within the policy of the school. So the verification forms, again, will hold up your financial aid. Oftentimes, you get that email within the portal of the college, so it's important that you are looking. You know, set aside time every week to check these portals to make sure there's nothing in there. The appeals. I personally like appeals to be happening around April. Every school, as I mentioned, has their own method of appealing. You can find them on their 
website. If you go to the financial aid section of any college, if you look up appeal form, they definitely have it. It's important for you to fill it out properly and provide any information that they're looking for. So I've talked a lot about FAFSA. I talked a lot about how it's tied to scholarships, whether you're a merit, someone who's getting a scholarship for good grades, a grid scholarship, which are your automatic scholarships, and for your Pell Grants and such. This slide, it still makes me sad. <laughs> this is pretty much what I'm still seeing. There are many people who never fill out or finish filling out the FAFSA. And therefore, that we still have quite a few people who are not filling it out and are creating a situation where they're not gonna get scholarships. So again, I hope you have heard how important knowing your es what your estimated family contribution is. We have several ways of getting this. You can use free tools all over the internet. You can use our tool, which is free to you, that's right on our website, find the pig, follow the instructions, you will receive a, an estimate of what it would be like to go to a public school and an estimate of what it would be like to go to a private school and what you're looking at as far as your estimated family contribution. Your other option is when we use a much more comprehensive tool and we do charge a small amount and we create a situation where we can look up and give you reports on specific colleges. I encourage you to start with the estimated family contribution, the PIG, so you have an understanding. You need to gather certain items for it, and you have an understanding of what those reports look like. If you would like a more comprehensive report specific to schools, then please get a hold of us. You can either text 208-277-8310, text EFC, I'll get a hold of you, or you're more than welcome to send us an email at info at thecoachingeducator.com. That is info at thecoachingeducator.com. Our next series is going to be talking specifically about scholarships, but it's important for you to know before you start looking for scholarships what your estimated family contribution is. I hope this helped. Stay safe. Please, if you need any extra help, if you want a free consultation, we have that opportunity on our website as well. Just book a free consultation and connect with us. Connect with us here on The Coaching Educator through YouTube. Ask any question and we'll try to provide you with answers that will help you. Thank you so much. I hope this helped. Bye now.